As with most Asian kids, academic subjects were treated with paramount importance in my household. Mum set a high threshold of 95%, and I had to secure at least that in all my subjects. Maths and science were given more weight, and mum pushed me to get full marks there. These standards were conveyed to my private tutor, who was responsible for helping me achieve them. I was quite capable of meeting these demands, and often did. However, on one occasion, I failed badly on a maths test. The way I saw it, the sooner I finished that maths test, the earlier I could get out and play. So I made a rushed job of it and submitted a paper full of mistakes. Later, when I received the score, I knew that I was in trouble. I got 87% and my grade-obsessed mum was not happy with it. That evening she informed my tutor of my pathetic performance and asked her to deal with me. My tutor studied my test carefully and looked over my answers. She grabbed the ruler and positioned me in front of her. She told me that it was an easy test, where I should have easily scored 100%. Instead, I made many careless mistakes. My tutor remarked that it was quite unusual for me to do so dismally, and she asserted that there must be some reason for my lack of concentration during the test. She demanded I tell her that reason truthfully. I was awestruck by her astute analysis, but I lied. I told her that my concentration was fine during the test, and I just happened to make a few mistakes. Miss pulled my hand out and sizzled it with a couple of very hard smacks with her ruler. I pulled back, but she drew my other hand out and smacked it equally hard. She then warned me to tell the truth or she would keep smacking me like this. The hard smack stung and my hands turned red. I was jolted by the smacking and grew increasingly nervous and fearful. Almost instantly, I apologized to Miss and told her the true story. Miss lectured me for a few minutes on the importance of my schoolwork, then she announced that she would give me eight very hard smacks on my bottom for my poor performance and a further six on my legs for not being truthful the first time around. She bent me over the desk and smacked very hard. Then she ordered me to go up on my toes and smacked my calves. It was painful and I was crying all the time, pleading for forgiveness. Finally, Miss made me kneel facing the wall for a few minutes, then consoled me. After this correction, I never let my concentration lapse in a test again, and certainly never lied to Miss either. Corporal punishment in the 50s and 60s I grew up in the UK West Midlands and received my share of spankings, it was never called that in my day, usually a good hiding or the high jump, both at school and at home. Although people nowadays may be taken aback that CP was so commonly used we just accepted it as normal. It was even reinforced by TV programs such as Wacko, Billy Bunter, and the comics of the day which often depicted slipperings and canings. I always got the impression that boys were more readily whacked than girls, although I was caned at primary school along with about a dozen other boys and girls for participating in a snowball fight. I also knew a girl very well who sometimes received the cane at home and indeed this prompted my parents to get one for occasional home use too. Usually, I received the slipper at home but if I stepped too far out of line a light stingy cane applied to the seat of my pyjama trousers would certainly get my attention. Fear and Corporal Punishment Whenever the memory of school CP occurs in female conversation, it is so often accompanied with fear so tangible, that one gets the impression of trauma. My mother relates her one time in detention, mixed, state, late fifties. Now, this was no big thing, an automatic punishment for lateness, etc., and involved a relatively large number of pupils. Because of the common nature of this punishment, attendance was noted by each child signing out of detention. Mom was a good girl, so she had no experience of the routine, and forgot to sign out. Guess what the penalty was for missing your detention? I think that every time she looks back at her school days she relives the absolute terror that she felt at the possibility of being summoned for the cane that next day, didn't happen. My grandmother seethed with anger when she recalled being struck with a ruler, hand, at her school. 
Many European countries had banned CP before World War II, and some before World War I, because their phycologists, damn, I really need an any application spell checker, had discovered this trauma effect. I mean, think about this for a second. If you are a parent and discipline your kids in any way, would you really want them breaking into a cold sweat at the thought of punishment, or its use on their siblings, throughout the rest of their adult lives? Does fair and reasonable punishment ever cause this kind of trauma? Were girls at school fearful of unjust punishment? Inappropriate punishment? Punishment by someone who was not their parent? Punishment involving physical pain? Punishment by a male? The constant threat of punishment in the air? Automatic punishment for offences that one was likely to eventually commit, like forgetting gym kit? The humiliation of having other people know that you have been punished. Punishment at home following punishment at school. The appearance of the punishment on the school leaving record, back when many girls left at 15 without formal qualifications. I think for me the fear was nothing to do with physical pain, it was the humiliation. One, of other people knowing. Two, of the person witnessing the event. 3. The thought of the punisher touching your bottom or seeing you in a submissive position. Even just being threatened with a spanking in front of others was humiliating. I am willing to bet that these feelings were common in most girls, young women punished this way. This female psychology has been well understood for a century or more and is the reason why CP of girls, women prisoners has been banned in so many places for so long. Now consider the places that refused bans or heaven forbid, reintroduced CP of schoolgirls. There is only one excuse that is even halfway valid, and even that falls apart under scrutiny. The excuse, a political argument women are treated unequally in every level of society. Why? Because women are assumed to be passive, weak, delicate, and less able to think in the hard ways that men do. How do we change this? Challenge the lie that women are different from men because different means less in reality. Women must become as men, in attitude, in experience, in moral outlook. Only then can women achieve equality. Take education. Your beginning is your end. Boys are considered important enough to beat, girls are not. This must change. Ah yes, all those socialist councils cheering as girls are beaten in their district comprehensives for the sake of female advancement. Sorry, I'm strong to the political left, but equality with the slipper and cane has nothing to do with creating a healthy or successful educational environment for girls. Men and women learn in different ways, in the same ways as they love in different ways. Equality of opportunity does not always mean treating people the same. We should receive help according to our needs and skills. We will then feel valued because we are treated in a way that is personal to us. Girl Slippered at Secondary School I have read the doubts expressed on this forum, and others, concerning the slippering of secondary school girls and again confirm that it was not uncommon, as befitted the disciplinary environment of my time at school. 1960s. In my own case I received corporal punishment only once and that was as a girl in the third year, now known as Year 9, at a school in NW London in 1966. My slippering was for a known offence, truanting from PE lessons, and was accepted by me as being justified and reasonable in the circumstances. The punishment was formally administered at the end of a PE lesson by the male head of the department. I was told to wait in a room next to the changing room while the slipper, which was about a man s size 11, was fetched. I began to tremble when I saw it and was in an even worse state when informed that I was to get six on my bottom, I was wearing my PE kit which consisted of t-shirt and gym knickers, and was then told to bend over and touch my toes. The slipper stung and left a warm glow in my bottom afterwards. This short story is about Angry Mrs. Anderson. In our days in early 1960s a corporal punishment in schools was very common. Most of the teachers used the cane as the instrument of punishment. I attended one of the strictest schools of London. 
Obviously, one rule of the school was that every pupils should arrive on time. While I was usually very good academically, I was occasionally late for school, and I almost received about 10 punishments for this. Until the ninth standard a class, punishments were administered by our physical training teacher, Mrs. Julie. However, when I was in 10th standard she retired and a new teacher, Mrs. Anderson, was recruited. Mrs. Anderson was tall and well-built, and frequently carried a belt or a cane in her hand. On the very first day of her job, I got into school late, and she appeared in no time with a belt in her hand. I was terrified to see her giant figure. On that day, I was the only student to come late, so she lectured me for ten minutes, and then told me to kneel down in front of the school until the lunch break, this was horrible as the surface was tarmac, and I was in shorts. In the lunch break, Mrs. Anderson came to find me and told me to follow her. She took me to her room and then retrieved her belt. She told me to place myself over a chair, then brought the belt back and forth over my bottom. I was in tears in no time as the belt came down. After about ten hard smacks, she stopped and warned me not be late again. But somehow I forgot the punishment very quickly and was late again the next week. Mrs. Anderson was angry at seeing me again so soon. She brought the cane and delivered four hard smacks on my bottom, then she grabbed my shirt collar and dragged me into her room, where she caned my hand as well. How did lady teachers learn to discipline? Having been a schoolboy in the Midlands of England during the 50s at grammar school I got the cane across my bottom several times from the headmaster in his study. In junior school, I got the cane several times from the headmistress and other teachers always on the hand. I am firm of the opinion that 50% of the school kids of that era were caned boys who were indeed fortunate to make it through a school career without getting it and girls were indeed unfortunate if they ever got it and even then it was exclusively on the hand. A question that has been intriguing me for years is how did the lady teachers know how to cane a boy's bottom? How many strokes? How hard? What position to make them adopt? What to do with boys who refused to bend over? How did they know when a boy could not take any more? Slipperings? Etc. Since all male teachers would have had the cane at school or seen people caned or at least been party to discussions about the cane they would know about how it felt and how it was done. Lady teachers and headmistresses would probably not have had this knowledge so how did they learn? Was it at teachers' training college, if so what were they taught and how? Matron spankings remembered. I was left wondering if we had the same matron. In the 1960s, I went to an English prep school in Dorset as a boarder between the ages of 8 and 13. We had a 30-something matron called Miss Rose, I think, who ruled over us armed with her right hand or her mason and Pearson hairbrush. Both were used two or three times a week to spank any naughty little boy who crossed her path. The spankings took place in the bathroom next to the junior dormitory, we would always be spanked, having put our pyjamas on first. Because it was a big empty room, the noise really used to echo around and was very audible in the dormitory next door. Then, of course, you had the humiliation of being led red-eyed into the dorm and put straight to bed without the usual story to comfort you. These spankings seemed much worse than the slipper or cane from the head, maybe because they were very public and consisted of more than the usual six of the best, which was the official school punishment. I can barely remember why I was taken over her knee but the whole ritualistic hands on head, across her knee routine sticks very firmly in my mind, as does the stinging bottom afterwards which was still sore the next morning. Perhaps our nurse moved on to your school as matron. I never did know her name, she was always a nurse. But I recall her as being mid-twenties, maybe, in the fifties. She was a very enthusiastic smacker. We would be spanked in the dormitory in front of the other four or five boys in the room. It was a rare night when one of us did not go over her knee. I rarely went more than a few days without going to bed with my bottom well and truly smacked. She would sit on the culprit's bed, then hand out a generous ration of smacks. She did not use a hairbrush but once in a while, she would use a slipper. 
To be fair, tears were not usual, except when the slipper was employed, but it normally came pretty close to it. We were spanked for talking, dawdling, not making our beds tidily, not washing hands before meals, hair not brushed neatly etc. Her favourite turn of phrase, especially for the slipper, was, you are a naughty little boy, and you have been asking for this for some time. Mary Gallagher was one of a large family from a new housing development. She had the good luck to be very bright and thereby qualify for a scholarship to our school. Bright, I say, but not bright enough to learn how to avoid the various punishments the school had on offer, a bit like me really, as I was serving yet another detention for persistent lateness. Mary was also an excellent athlete and hockey player. Debbie, the team captain, and I recruited her just recently to the team. It made me lose my prodigy status, but I didn't really mind. Mary was a very sweet girl, but could she talk? I think it was mainly that for which she was forever in trouble. I suppose it was trying to compete with the others in her family that she talked so much, a loving family, but strict, so she was no stranger to discipline at home, and I believe she was no stranger to Miss Roberts's slipper in class. She was obviously given the detention by one of her other teachers. If her misdemeanor had been committed in Miss Roberts's class, she would not have been sitting in the detention room, in fact, she might not have been sitting at all. I can't remember the other girl's name, but the two of them had fallen into the trap of perceived safety when Miss Roberts went out for her coffee, and of course, got caught whispering loudly at each other when she sneaked back in. I'd thought about warning them, but realized the foolishness in that, especially as I was seeing a boyfriend that night and I knew exactly the lasting effects of Miss Roberts's slipper. It was deja vu for me when the two were called out to the front of the room. It reminded me of six months previously when Kathy and I had been standing there at the front guessing pretty accurately what was to be our immediate fate. I wondered which of the two would be nominated to fetch the slipper from Miss Roberts's classroom cupboard, as Kathy was for our punishment. Both girls likely knew where it was, but the honor was bestowed on me for some reason, possibly because I was perhaps more aware than anyone, the intricacies of releasing the lock and the plimsoll within, as I had had to wait for my three stokes that day as Miss Roberts struggled with it at length. No problem, the oil can on the window ledge was a testament to Miss Roberts's determination that the lock would work when required next time. Slightly relieved, I carried the implement back to the detention room, swishing it in the air with a sort of abandonment that came with knowing that on this occasion at least my bottom was safe, well it would be so long as I kept my head down and got to the end of the detention without incurring Miss Roberts's displeasure. I made the mistake though of swishing it against my left hand where it landed with quite a crack that echoed through the corridor and left me wincing with an almighty sting in my palm and fingers. Stupid or what? I handed the slipper to Miss Roberts, and I wondered if there was a slight smirk on her face suggesting she might have heard me testing my hand in the corridor. The first culprit was soon over the front desk, head facing the wall and bottom facing the class, with Mary forced to watch no doubt, with the goosebumps, an almost uncontrollable fear we all had when facing an imminent spanking from Miss Roberts. Having to watch while a co-defendant received her punishment first did not help at all. You weren't supposed to watch, but quite frankly it was impossible not to. By the third stroke, the girl was expressing her dissatisfaction more loudly. Her attempt to stand up and clutch her bottom, after the fourth met, with the dire warning of having to start again, if she repeated her disobedience. At the end she limped back to her desk in considerable disarray, crying quietly but openly. Six of the best from Miss Roberts was a fearsome punishment, as I well knew, but the standard for breaking detention period rules. Miss Roberts would normally have made her wait whilst her partner in crime received her comeuppance, but perhaps on this occasion took pity on the girl as it may have been her first time under the lash, well, size substantial plimsoll anyway. Mary next, as I said I don't think the plimsoll and Mary's were strangers, and it seemed Mary did know the routine, over the desk, and skirt back just trying to be helpful, not that it was going to do her any good. 
Miss Roberts, as I believe I told you, liked to measure her strokes. Whilst six strokes would only take just under a minute and a half, the 15 seconds pause between swats was there for a purpose, giving the girl time to acquaint herself with the sting and immense heat building up from each blow before the next one arrived. Whether she'd had six before I don't know. My two sixes from Miss Roberts were among the most memorable of my school disciplinary career, but then come to think of it so were the others, a six with a well-aimed and applied plimsoll was always enough to provide sufficient retribution and a reminder for a couple of days or probably more afterwards. The fourth stroke landed hard and Mary uttered her first verbal reaction, a sort of muffled ouch, which I can assure you was an understatement, the fifth after the fifteen-second pause landed in more or less the same place, and forced a groan from the end facing the wall where Mary's hands would have been clinging for dear life onto the edge of the desk. At the sixth she did cry out, not surprisingly, and then very slowly got up. She walked stiffly back, passing my desk on the way. Without wishing to be noticed by Miss Roberts, I couldn't avoid lifting my head slightly to give her a reassuring smile, empathy with a friend. Mary's chin crumpled a little, and she wiped away tears from both cheeks. I watched as she sat down, and the predictable reaction, as her chin crumpled again, wincing while parking herself on the hard wooden seat. Miss Roberts didn't immediately ask me to take the plimsoll back, and I wondered with some trepidation if my silent, but a fairly obvious exchange of glances with Mary on her return might have qualified me for failure to obey the no communication rule. Fortunately, she decided against to my great relief, I certainly did not want bruises on my bottom that night. I returned the slipper safely to its cupboard, remembering to not slap my hand with it again, especially as it was still tingling from the slipper's outward journey. Ms. Lucille's use of the spanking paddle. In the 1946-47 school year, going to the city schools in the Upper South, my second grade teacher was Ms. Lucille, who happened to be an old high school chum of my mom's. City, public, schools were always staffed by female teachers at the elementary and junior high levels. Girls were rarely paddled but boys were routinely spanked by these women when they violated any school or teacher's personal rule. Ms. Lucille was the most feared disciplinarian at Washington School and even kids in the rooms walked quickly by her open door. Her technique involved almost maximum embarrassment in addition to the paddling. She would call the young man up to her desk. As he got to her side, she would reach in her top drawer and retrieve a paddle whose wood had darkened through many years of use. She would lay the paddle on the top of her desk and talk calmly with the boy about what he was there for, give him a little hug and rapidly turn him face down over her lap. After he was in position, she would pick up the paddle and rub it in a motion on his bottom. She would then instruct the class to put their heads down on the desk, so no one would watch. Then we would hear the loud wax. Nobody got less than three, most got five to seven and extreme cases more than that. One time in the winter we all had our heads down listening to the wax and the boohooing when I peeked across the aisle. Ms. Lucille's little pet pupil, like me also called David, was standing up in his seat, watching what was going on up front. When Eugene, the boy getting the spanking, was done the class was told to raise their heads. Eugene came back to his seat, rubbing his eyes with one hand and his bottom with the other. Ms. Lucille then summoned David up in the usual ritual and then across her lap. The class was made to put their heads down again, then whack, whack, whack. After five I thought, she would stop, great sobs and pleas were coming from David, but then a sixth and a seventh. More loud balls and sobs came forth, then an eighth and a ninth and a tenth. I was shocked, as David was her pet. When David got back to his seat he put his head down on his desk and cried and sobbed for the remaining two hours until school was out. Ms. Lucille was about 48 or so, very tall and almost always wore a black suit trimmed in silver fox fur. To this day, I treasure her memory some fifty years later and honestly wish she was around so I could confess my misdeeds to her. My first senior school caning. It was 1957 and at the end of the summer holiday, 
I went to the big school, which was what we called the local grammar school. I was very excited and proud to walk to the bus stop in my new uniform. My sister Paula, three years older than me, was starting the fourth year at the same school and we travelled together. I had heard all about the school from Paula who had enjoyed her first three years there. Like all schools at that time, there was corporal punishment but according to Paula it wasn't much used unless you did something really bad. The first couple of weeks went really well and I made lots of new friends. The teachers all wore gowns and looked a bit fearsome but as long as you did your homework and behaved in class there was no problem. I used to walk home with my sister, usually accompanied by a couple of her friends. It was only a couple of miles and we used to pocket the bus fare, a halfpenny at the time, and spend it on sweets. I like this. I was quite a small boy for my age and I was quite proud to be walking along chatting to these three girls who were all quite tall, head and shoulders above me, and were really young women. In about the third week we were walking home and stopped outside the sweet shop. The girls were whispering to each other. My sister then gave me a few pennies and a note. She told me to give the note to the lady in the shop. I was a bit in awe of these big girls and so I did it without question and was surprised when the lady gave me a packet of five woodbine cigarettes. I took them back to my sister and off we walked down the road. After a few hundred yards the girls went into a field behind a large tree and I naturally followed. Out came the cigarettes, a match was produced, and one of them lit up. I hadn't seen my sister smoke before but she seemed to know what to do as did the other two as the cigarette was passed around and lots of coughing ensued. I plucked up courage and had a puff and nearly choked. From nowhere one of the teachers appeared and she noted our names and forms and warned us there would be trouble the next day. The girls were obviously worried but one of them put the remaining cigs in her satchel and off we went home in silence. The next morning our names were read out in assembly by the deputy headmistress and told to go straight to her office. The fact that the headmaster wasn't there that day seemed lucky to me because he looked like a fearsome character. Standing outside the office Paula asked her friend if she thought we would get the cane. Hope not, was the reply. I had been caned on the hand at junior school but the word was that in the big school you got it on your behind. A green light went on above the door and in we went. There was the deputy headmistress who sat behind a large desk. She was a tall lady, a bit plump with a kindly face. I'll come straight to the point, she said in a quiet voice, you were all seen smoking yesterday. Correct. We all nodded our heads. There seemed little point in denying it. You know how I detest caning older girls so I am going to give you four detentions. Did this include me I wondered? She then looked straight at me. This is extremely bad behaviour for a first year boy and I am going to give you the cane. I was frozen rigid and couldn't have protested if I had wanted to. She went to a large drawer and took out a very large cane. It seemed to be about as long as I was tall and had a bent handle. Bend over the desk, she commanded. I couldn't believe this. It was all their fault. If anyone should get away with it it should be me. I looked at them lined up looking less pale and more cheerful now. I went and bent over the desk having to stand on tiptoe to do it. She stood behind me and swished the cane through the air which made a terrifying noise. I thought I was going to pass out then whoosh. Splat. And the pain hit me. I saw stars, my teeth rattled and my whole body felt on fire. The second and third followed in quick succession and I didn't really feel those after the shock of the first. She had stopped and went to get up. One more, she commanded so I bent over the desk again. The fourth was worse than the first and I leaped up and danced around the office in agony. Once I had spent a few seconds dancing I line up with the girls to see her writing in a large book. You may all go now and let that be a lesson to you, and out we went. As we walked down the corridor the three girls were cheerfully chatting about how glad they were that they didn't get the cane and seemed oblivious to my agony and tears. The unfairness of this incident has never left me but I still find the thought of being caned by a dominant lady very exciting, preferably with another lady watching. The unfairness of this incident has never left me.
yes, yes. And I'm sure that when the policeman pulls you over you whinge, but all the other drivers were speeding, too. And there wasn't any hope of redressing the injustice by accidentally letting your parents know of the situation. Perhaps slyly informing them why your sister was so late home from school. I have to admit, though, getting you to buy their fags for them was pretty clever. It reminds me of something my cousin and I would have done with her little brother. Smacked by Miss Cawthorn. This happened when I moved to a new school. I had a new teacher was called Miss Cawthorn. She was a tall, well-dressed lady who smelled sweetly of violets and kept a little bell on her desk by which to bring the class to attention. She was the first really strict teacher I had ever encountered and coming from a school where corporal punishment was extremely rare, I was soon in for a rude awakening. I witnessed two spankings on my first day. A boy called Ian was called to the front of the class for persistent talking, made to bend over with his hands resting flat on the seat of a chair and then smacked three times with a very worn plimsoll. The spanking wasn't particularly hard but I remember being shocked. Later in the day, when Miss Cawthorn smacked a female pupil's bottom several times while the girl was standing disgraced in the corner, my head was reeling. I went home and replayed the two incidents over and over again, imagining what it would be like to bend over and feel the sting of Miss Cawthorn's plimsoll on my bottom. Once I had settled into the class, my mischievous nature began to assert itself. I was warned several times that I would end up being spanked. Miss Cawthorn's ominous words, always delivered face to face while she grasped the child's hand to be sure of their full attention, made butterflies swoop inside my stomach. How could something I longed for so badly fill me with such dread? One afternoon, I was being particularly difficult during an art lesson. Miss Cawthorn drew me to one side, her hand firmly holding me under the armpit, and lifted me to the tips of my toes. She then reached around and smacked my bottom almost lovingly three times. She then sat down and brought me to her side, where she could speak to me face to face. The next time I smack your bottom, young man, you will be in tears. Is that understood? That was understood. I was a good boy for the rest of the day. So good in fact that I barely lifted my face out of a book. Miss Cawthorn was delighted with the result and obviously thought the smacked bottom had done me the world of good. However, a few days later I was up to my old tricks again. While the rest of the class were sent out to play, I was kept back and told to approach the desk, where Miss Cawthorn sat sternly on a chair. You won't understand this, she began, but good children need to be smacked more than bad children. And while some children need one or two smacks with my slipper, others need a good old-fashioned spanking to keep them on the right track. I knew what was going to happen next. That was strange because I had never seen a child being spanked in the way that I was about to be spanked, except in comic books and once in a television movie but I gazed down reverently at her lap and knew for certain that I was soon to be positioned across it. That day she was wearing a black trouser suit. She had strong, broad thighs, over which I was now gently laid. My feet didn't touch the floor and my arms hung limply down the other side. I was expecting a rapid salvo of stinging smacks, each new slap delivered before the pain of its predecessor had even time to register, but they didn't come. For a long time, I lay over her knee while she lectured me in a kind, concerned way. Then there was a pause. I tensed, relaxed, tensed again, and eventually went limp, resigned to the fact that Miss Cawthorn would spank me in her own good time. At that precise moment, the first blow fell, and it was a blow, not a slap. Her hand thumped the seat of my thin shorts like a heavy book. The wind left me in a grunt of pain and surprise. The next blow fell a short time after. Again it was solid and hard, as though she was using a leather paddle on my bottom. I twisted my head around just in time to see Miss Cawthorn's empty palm descending. I cried out and kicked my legs. Miss Cawthorn secured me by the waist and delivered an incalculable number of hard, rhythmical spanks which landed musically on my bottom like perfectly timed drum beats. When I was eventually let up and steered sobbing into the corner to consider my punishment, my bottom felt stiff and bruised and sore as hell. 
The fire she lit there glowed for more than an hour and didn't fully subside until much later that evening. It was still sore to the touch for two days, during which time I padded my school chair with my coat. Needless to say, I was a model pupil from then on. By the time I was in the seventh grade, I had been paddled only one time previously by a teacher, in fourth grade. The paddling itself had stung considerably, and the teacher concerned had administered it with a flea-back ping-pong type paddle. Our seventh grade teacher was Miss Wiseman, a woman in her late twenties or early thirties, with neatly trimmed dark hair and who wore a no-nonsense at glasses. On the first day of school, she had made a point about how she was a strong proponent of discipline. For most of the year, she administered writing punishments for minor infractions. We noticed that even these punishments were typically pretty severe, in that she would make the class write long sentences hundreds of times, which would take hours. On one occasion, I simply turned in one page of written punishments and attached scribbled pages along with the first page. I thought she would not notice the backup pages, and I would save myself a great deal of writing. It worked and she did not notice it. However, when I tried it a second time, she caught me. She was angry with me and doubled the punishment to be turned in the next day. It was too much to do so I simply skipped it, totally thinking that I would be punished by having recess withheld or detention. The next day, when I told her that I had not completed the punishment, Miss Wiseman again turned angry, and then really surprised me by pulling a paddle out of her desk. It was about a foot in length, maybe five inches wide, and about a half inch thick. I immediately began to panic I told her I would do the punishment, as she had asked. She replied that it was too late, and that she was going to teach me a lesson in front of the class. I then muttered a mild profanity to myself, which really made her turn very angry as she heard it. Her face turned red and she began slapping the paddle against her hand quite vigorously. She then pulled my arm very strongly and hauled me in front of the class, exclaiming that this would be the last time I would ever utter such a word. By this time I was getting anxious, because she seemed to be ready to really paddle me hard. She then said, pull everything out of your back pockets and put them on the desk. I could not take my eyes off the paddle, wondering how much it would sting. She also told me to take my glasses off and place them on the desk. She then commanded me to bend over and grab my ankles and told me very sternly to not block my rear end with my hand. I did as I was told and seemed to be in that position for a while as she lectured me and then announced I would be receiving five swats. I looked behind me and saw Miss Wiseman swing the paddle back very far behind her shoulder. I had a feeling she could swat hard. The paddle made a swishing sound and then landed with a crack that sounded like a firecracker going off, with a strong echo in the room. It felt like a swarm of bees had stung me at once on my right cheek. The force of the first swat actually propelled me forward. Very quickly the second swat came with a loud crack. It too was applied to my right cheek and stung tremendously. I began to stand up, but Miss Wiseman sternly ordered me back into the paddling position. I braced for the third swat. Crack. It came with even stronger force on my left cheek and threw me forward again. Then came the fourth swat, this time applied to the lower part of both cheeks. The stinging pain made me grab my ankles with increased force and made me rise up on my toes. Miss Wiseman said, I will give you a moment before I give you the fifth swat. After nearly a minute, she said, grab your ankles again for the next swat. It came with a very loud crack and was applied again on the lower part of both cheeks. I really felt that fifth swat as my backside was really burning by this time. She then ordered me to sit back down, adding, if you can. Finally, she said, I hope the paddling I just gave you will be a reminder to watch your manners and never try to deceive your teacher ever again, young man. I listened and in the future was always truthful and discreet out of fear of Miss Wiseman and her blistering paddle. The stinging lasted for a full 15 minutes, but I felt that paddling for several dows afterward.
The following doesn't relate to any specific incident, it just explains how boys and girls, naughty enough to be reported to the headmistress at my primary school, were punished back in the 1970s. When I was at primary school, spankings for the most part were given by the headmistress, though the occasional smack on the bottom would sometimes be given in class. These kind of smacks were not that common, however, anyone reported to the headmistress or unlucky enough to be caught in the corridor, if sent out from class, was dearly summoned to be dealt with in the lunch break. This was bad enough if you got into trouble in the morning, but if you were in trouble in the afternoon, the situation was compounded by an anxious wait until the following day for your punishment. Anyone waiting for punishment had to line up, in the corridor, outside a particular classroom, until she came along and called everyone in. Sometimes you'd be the only one, I hated that, but usually, there would be three or four. The most I remember lining up were eight of us. I can't remember why there were so many, but can only assume a group got into trouble. Whilst boys were the worst offenders, girls certainly weren't exempt. When in the classroom you lined up against the wall and listened to a general telling off. You were then called out, one at a time to explain the specific transgression. You would then go over her knee for a good spanking or have to bend over a desk for a sound slippering. You would watch each other get their punishment. This certainly built the tension until it was your turn. I managed to avoid any kind of punishment, until my third year. When I did finally have to be punished, I was extremely nervous. I can't remember why I was there but do remember being very reluctant to step forward when told to. I was the only one that day and didn't know what to expect. Eventually and nervously, I shuffled forward. I was duly put over the headmistress's knee and given a firm spanking. To my relief, it was not as bad as I got from dad. The spanking itself certainly hurt and made me gasp, but I managed not to cry. I was pretty good at school and didn't get spanked too often, maybe about once or occasionally twice in a term. Whilst I saw others get slippered, I managed to avoid it until I was older. I was aware, from reactions I'd seen, that it did hurt more, but hadn't to that point experienced it. On the day, when instead of being put over her knee, I was instructed to bend over the desk, I remember my stomach tightening. I duly bent over and waited for what felt ages, though it was only a few seconds. The slipper rested on my bottom, then came the first smack. Normally when I cried, it built up slowly, from a sob a moan, then open tears. On this occasion, I literally burst into tears, straight away. I had a very sore bottom that day and any other time I was slippered. The following doesn't relate to any specific incident, but just explains how boys and girls, naughty enough to be reported to the headmistress at my primary school, were punished back in the 1970s. When I was at primary school, spankings proved an additional issue for me. This was because my mum was a classroom assistant and dinner lady in the school. She always was told about my punishment. During my lower school and early middle school years, I had a personal tutor to help me with my studies. This teacher was a young woman doing her graduate studies whom I addressed as Miss. She would come home every evening and spend several hours teaching me. Miss always dressed in a salwa, a traditional South Asian dress, showcasing her curvaceous body, and adorned herself with a simple necklace and dangling hoops. Her nail-polished fingers always caught my attention, as did her long velvety hair that she braided, tied into a bun or sometimes made into a ponytail. On some days Miss decorated her forehead with a bindi the coloured dot and on occasions wore jewel eyeliner over her eyes. Irrespective, she looked gorgeous every single day. Miss was very affectionate. She would often caress me lovingly, give me hugs and kisses and even bring me gifts. She was also a dedicated and skilled teacher, who meticulously managed all aspects of my studies. She designed a routine and got me accustomed to it. 
Miss made me study in a structured and methodical manner. She instilled an ethic of hard work and awakened my competitive spirit. Overall, she provided the necessary framework wherein I could realize my full potential and flourish. Miss was young, beautiful and kind, but she was also strict and demanding. Discipline was central to her approach. She had permission from my mother to use her footlong aluminium ruler, which she always kept besides her on the study table and frequently put to use, three to four times a day was common, and on many days, it would be more. Miss punished me regularly for a wide range of study-related stuff. She would give me a sharp smack or two on the arm or thigh. She would make me stand before her, lock my hands in hers, and administer a few brisk swats on the legs. She would bend me over the study table or chair and smack my bottom. She would hold my hands firmly and smack the open palms and even the knuckles. These beatings were painful but very effective, I would do anything to avoid the ruler's nasty sting. My own mother never physically disciplined me. Nevertheless, seeing that I feared the punishments I received from my teacher, she took advantage of it. So after a while, whenever I misbehaved or disobeyed her, mum simply reported it to miss and asked her to punish me. Miss would then give me a good dose of the ruler inside the study room. This way, all my mother had to say was, do you want me to tell this to your miss, and I would instantly bring out my best behaviour. Miss often said that I was lucky she was not my mother. If she were my mum, Miss told me, she would not only use the ruler but also a belt. I often thought about this and wondered how my upbringing would be if Miss were indeed my mum. Just the thought of having her around me all the time would make me nervous. When I was reached fifth grade, Miss married and moved to a different city. I missed her a lot and longed for those evenings where she would sit with me and make me study. I constantly recalled how I would look up at her with love and trepidation while she corrected my work. Her ruler still lay on the table, but my disciplinarian had left me. I began to dream of her as my mother. In my mind, I construed scenarios of her disciplining me with a belt. I needed such a lady, I needed a strict mother. Years later, mum and I did meet Miss again. She was still the same woman I knew, but now with two lovely children of her own. During the conversation, mum remarked, your kids are so well behaved, do you discipline them with a ruler, as you did with my son? Miss replied, I have always believed in discipline. Sent out of class. At my school, only the headmaster used the cane and it was certainly not an everyday punishment, reserved for serious offences or repeated bad behaviour. In practice, it tended to be the same few boys in my class who got it during our whole time at school. I was one of the well-behaved boys and never got my cane. None of my friends did, either, until an event in our second year. My friend Alan who sat next to me had offended the teacher somehow in our maths class. He sent him out to stand outside in the corridor. This was not regarded as a particularly serious thing and normally the teacher would call the boy back into class after a few minutes and ask him if he was ready to behave now and let him back into class. That's what happened this time. After about 10 minutes the teacher asked a boy sitting in the front to tell Alan he could come back. But he wasn't there. I assumed he'd wandered off somewhere to amuse himself. I knew some of the naughtier boys did this but it wasn't like Alan. After about another five minutes there was a knock on the door and it was Alan. He came in and said that the headmaster had said he could come back into class. He didn't say he'd got the cane, though the thought immediately leaped through my head, and the teacher didn't ask him. He looked completely normal as he walked through the class and sat down next to me. I whispered to him to ask him what had happened but he didn't reply. But at break, he told me the whole story. As he had been standing there outside the classroom the headmaster had come along and asked him what he was doing there. So he said the teacher had sent him out and the headmaster sent him to wait for him outside his office. Alan did as he was told. He must have been a bit worried. The only interaction between the headmaster and boys in our class was when he caned them. He wasn't kept waiting long and the headmaster ushered him into his room. 
He said that there was no point in Alan wasting time standing in the corridor when he could be learning but he had to learn not to disrupt a lesson. He told him to take off his jacket and bend over. This was all very quick according to Alan, no long lecture or anything, he just said he was going to cane him. Alan had to bend over in the middle of the room holding his legs. He did not have a chair or table to hold on to. I imagine that must have made it worse. He got three strokes, again laid on very quickly. Alan said it really hurt and he was very glad when the head stopped after the third and told him to get up. The next day when we changed for PE I saw the marks on Alan's bottom. In my junior school in the late 50s, corporal punishment was in use for various offences, by all the teachers, but the most feared punishment was to be sent to the headmistress, whose reputation and right arm was renowned far and wide. One of the clearest memories I have of her is the day that I fell off the wall. In a secluded part of the playground was a low wall, only about 18 inch high, and a favourite game was for one person to stand on the wall with his or her back to a post, and for others to try to come along the wall and dislodge the defender. Naturally, this game was forbidden, but we played it anyway. On this day, a girl called Julia was defending, and I was next in line to try. Somehow Julia overbalanced me, and I fell face down onto the tarmac floor. Although I put out my hands, my face struck the floor as well as my hands and I grazed a good part of my cheek and both palms. As I cried out, a teacher came around the corner of what happened to the lookout, I don't know, and saw what had occurred. The others scattered as Julia and I were marched indoors to the office. Iodine was briskly applied to my grazes, and then we were placed outside the headmistress's office to await our fate. We were summoned in and the facts quickly established. Although Julia had pushed me off the wall we were both adjudged equally guilty, which was fair enough. The fact that I had been injured and was in pain from that was dismissed as irrelevant. That the whole school had been warned to cease this game a week or so previously was forcefully pointed out to us, so as well as being punished for the game, we were to be punished for defiance as well. The headmistress then produced her slipper, this being a black gym shoe with a thick rubber sole, not some lightweight carpet affair, and ordered us both to bend down and touch toes. Six or eight hard wax followed, we were told to rise and informed that our defiance was yet to be dealt with. We were then made to bend down again, and she then delivered about eight further wax to our behinds. We stood in the corner crying for an hour, were given notes for our parents, and ordered back to class. Spanked for skipping lessons. In seventh grade, my friend Kelly and I had PE together. Neither of us was the athletic type, so it was somewhat torture to us. We were normally very well behaved and never got into any trouble. However, one spring day it was unusually warm for North Carolina. Miss Pierce, the PE teacher, had the idea that we should spend it inside playing basketball. Kelly and I were not very good at basketball and very interested in working on our tans so we slipped out, no one was interested in picking us for their team anyway, and stretched out on the wall outside overlooking the softball fields. Our regulation PE uniform of grey t-shirt and blue shorts was conducive to getting some sun and we removed our socks and shoes to really relax. We had soaked up some rays for about 20 minutes when we saw portly Ms. Pierce marching across the parking LOT. She walked up to us and said, you are both coming inside with me now. I started to put my shoes back on but she grabbed each of us by the arm and we were basically dragged barefoot across the asphalt parking lot, through the gymnasium where our classmates were playing basketball. Most seemed to stop and stare at us, with some giggling as most had never seen either of us in any trouble and certainly not dragged in such a humiliating fashion. It began to occur to me that I was in a lot of trouble. Miss Pierce had a reputation as a paddle swinger but usually only for boys after a fight. I began to get butterflies in my stomach and the next thing I knew, we were in her office. She sat us down in two chairs on one side of her desk and she went to the other side and sat down. She told us she was extremely angry with us and that she was tired of little girls like you that think you are too cool and cute, not participating. She reached into her top drawer and out came a wooden paddle with holes. 
She then said, we are going to find out how cool you are after five licks. Kelly, stand up and bend over. My heart had sunk when she pulled the paddle out but now this was all too real. I had been spanked occasionally but usually with hand and only once with a belt, certainly not by anyone other than my parents and not ever in front of anyone. As Ms. Pierce walked to our side of the desk and moved Kelly's chair out of the way, my chubby but cute, blonde pal bent over and held onto the backs of her knees. As I witnessed Kelly's vulnerability, I thought of the thin cotton shorts that I had on and the even thinner worn cotton panties I saved to wear during PE. Miss Pierce placed the paddle against Kelly's but and reminded her to stay in position. Suddenly, she reared back and brought a sharp spank across Kelly's backside. Before Kelly could react, the second one was following the first, and the third seemed to come even quicker. I was really getting scared now. From my vantage point, I could see Kelly's but jiggle violently to each swat and now I could hear her reaction as Ms. Pierce took a brief break to let the first round sink in. Kelly groaned and instantly started to cry. M. Pierce then smacked number four and Kelly straightened up and grabbed her butt, howling. Miss Pierce pushed her back in position and levied one last mighty swat that caused Kelly to shriek and collapse over the desk, bawling and rubbing her rear end furiously. I could not believe what I had just witnessed, nor what was coming my way. However, I did notice that through a glass window in the door many of my classmates were craning over one another to catch a glimpse, almost all of them boys, of course. Miss Pierce then gave me the order, Kimberly Lynn, stand up, bend over and grab your ankles. I hurriedly did so as I could not stand to look at Kelly sobbing anymore and I really just wanted to take my spanking and get out of there at this point. As I stood up, my nervous, cold bare feet seemed even colder on the cement floor. I bent over and touched just below my knees while watching Ms. Pierce out of the corner of my eye. Instantly, I turned bright red as the embarrassment of what was about to transpire set in. I distinctly remember being more concerned at that point about the boys watching rather than the actual spanking itself. That changed soon enough as the first lick smacked my butt. It was on fire instantly. The next spank followed rapidly as did the third swat. I could not believe how little protection my shorts gave me. I was determined not to cry but I did straighten up as she paused after the third swat. This enraged Ms. Pierce and she instantly grabbed my arm and wore my butt out three more times, giving me a total of six. The heat, plus the injustice of receiving more of a spanking than my friend was too much as I unabashedly rubbed my ass and howled, eventually succumbing to tears. Ms. Pierce immediately ordered us out of the office and we walked toward the girls' locker room, socks and shoes in hand, past our snickering classmates. I have never been more embarrassed in my life. During that walk, my face was fire engine red and I found out in the locker room that my butt was too. Swimming pool spanking. I grew up in Florida in the late 70s. At this point in time, spankings were not expected but still common. I was in the sixth grade and had never been spanked before. Our school had a small pool used for gym class. It was made perfectly clear that we could never use it without having permission. Late April is terribly hot in Florida and the gym teacher, who was the only certified lifeguard in the school, was out for the day. We knew we were not allowed to use the pool but a few of us decided to take a quick dip during our recess anyway. Besides, we all had our bathing suits, we didn't know the teacher would be out. So me, my best friend Bob, Chrissy, the most beautiful sixth grader in the world, and Jen, who Bob had a crush on since fourth grade, went swimming. Then we heard the bell ring for the end of recess. We all frantically tried to dry off and head for class when Miss Thomas entered the room screaming about how irresponsible we were, I guess someone in the class ratted us out. She told the girls to go downstairs, adding that she would be down there to deal with them in a minute. Bob and I stood there, knowing the inevitable was coming. I was the first to go. Miss Thomas had me in a very embarrassing position, she sat in the lifeguard's chair, very high, so classrooms of kids may have seen, I still don't know, and ordered me to climb up, which I did. I lay face down across her knee, knowing a spanking on the seat of a wet bathing suit would hurt. 
Then she told me to lift my hips. I did as she asked and without warning, she told me how bad I had been. She placed her hand on my tush as if to size me up and made me wait for the first spank. All of a sudden, I began to feel her strong hand against my soft bottom. I soon began to kick and scream. I kicked so hard that my bathing suit fell off my ankles and into the pool. After about 25 hard smacks, she asked me if I learned my lesson. Of course, I said yes m and I was allowed down. I scampered down the steps and into the pool to retrieve my suit. I didn't even have the courage to watch Bob get his punishment, and I never talked to Chrissy or Jen again. When I was in school in the mid-fifties, the coach room was where you got swats when needed. In the fifth grade, I had the first young teacher I had ever had and all of the boys had an immediate crush on her. During the second or third week of school, two girls got into a fight at recess, and we all thought they were going to be paddled. To our disappointment, Miss Moore said that the girls were too old for swats and she made them stand in a corner. About a week later, I got into trouble and went to stand in the corner. However, to my horror, Miss Moore told me instead that I should go to the coat room and take to get ready for chastisement. She informed me that she would come in and take care of me in a few minutes. She then told the class that she believed boys of my age need to be spanked often and hard, and she would start with me in a few minutes. About 10 minutes she came into the coat room with an 18 inches wooden ruler. She turned me over her knee like a mother would and gave me 25 hard smacks with the ruler across my bare bottom. I then had to stay after school and receive another 25 smacks before I was allowed to go home. Miss Moore spanked one of the boys in our class almost every day, and at least once a week it was me. The only positive thing about it was that she did not notify our parents, so I escaped getting a further smacked bottom at home. The real problem was that I began to look forward to having the teacher spank me, and I often went out of my way to get into trouble that would result in my being spanked. I would especially cause trouble if there had been girls in trouble during the day, because they would have to stay after school to wash the blackboards, and after school, the teacher would spank my bottom in front of them, and not in the coach room. I have been obsessed with spanking ever since. Due to my abiding interest in corporal punishment, I do find myself visiting a number of websites related to the subject, most of them demonstrating diametrically opposed attitudes. There are those who have a keen interest in CP, experienced it without regrets as a child, and wholeheartedly support it as a means of discipline for today's youngsters. In my experience, these people tend to be older and were at school in the days when CP was still legal. Then there are those who were badly abused in the past and who mostly have a natural aversion to CP. However, even some of this group may still consider less harsh use of spanking as reasonable discipline. On the other hand, there are those who consider a mere single slap to the clothed bottom to be abuse, the latter tend to be from a younger generation. So we found that those supporting CP in the home are often abused online by others who suggest that they are in favor of toddlers being harshly whipped, which is hardly fair comment. The long and short of it is that we've gone from one extreme to the other in the past century, and thus I believe discipline and punishment were more balanced when I myself was in full-time education, half a century ago. Roald Dahl writes about CP at several schools in his childhood. He was so anti that he told his headmaster at Repton School that he would refuse to cane younger boys in the event of him being made a prefect. The result was that he never was. Dahl's anti-CP sentiments were so strong that they formed the basis of one of his short stories, Galloping Foxley, which was adapted for television in the series Tales of the Unexpected. My own father attended a prep school where the headmaster once caned the entire class because he was dissatisfied with their work. Later, at boarding school, my dad was caned by prefects. He also administered the occasional punishment himself in time, although, as a fair-minded man, I can't imagine that he abused this privilege. Dad was quite philosophical about his boarding school experiences, he said that the prefects maintained discipline, so allowing the masters to teach. I remember once watching my sister being spanked by mum with a light kitchen spatula. 
Perhaps rather inadvisedly, my sister's response to the smacking was to keep yelling, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. Quite possibly it didn't, but it was still a foolish thing to say. That aside, my only real experiences of CP were at school. I attended a small private primary school. One boy had his knuckles wrapped with a his ruler by the strict headmistress and proprietor, but I think he was more upset by the fact that the punishment broke his ruler, rather than the pain in his hand. For the next year, I attended a private prep school. Here CP wasn't common, but it was quite an event when it did occur. Only the headmaster used to beat the kids the only boys, never the girls, and he used a long-handled wooden spoon known as the basting spoon. I can recall several instances when a boy incurred his wrath, resulting in his roaring, I shall bring up the basting spoon. You could have heard a pin drop as he galloped down the stairs to his study, while every child held their breath. Two boys were disciplined for throwing a ball of paper at each other, one boy was brought from another class by his form mistress for being cheeky to her, while a third was punished for gabbling and shouting out nonsensical answers. In retrospect, the latter possibly suffered from Tourette's, which of course wasn't recognised back in the mid-1960s. On each occasion, the miscreants were ordered to bend over and received three hefty whacks with the spoon. Nowadays that would seem barbaric, but I suppose it was nothing more than a short, sharp shock, which stung but didn't leave marks, and generally kept boys on the straight and narrow. Dot as an example of just how much stricter discipline was in those days, the biggest scandal in my time there came when four boys were ordered to report to the headmaster's study after assembly. The basting spoon was applied to each of their bottoms in turn. Their crime? Someone had seen them eating sweets at the town's bus station a half a mile from the school while still in uniform. My next school was a state primary my sister, and I attended as something of a fill-in measure while a house move went through. Dad had changed jobs, requiring a relocation, and thus presenting something of a problem, as private schools required you to give a term's notice before leaving. Although in the UK private schools are perhaps more strongly associated with corporal punishment, I have to say that I witnessed more spankings at the state primary in one and a half terms than I did in a whole seven years at my big school later on. Practically every boy in the class, myself included, ended up bending over for a slippering at some point or another. However, unlike the scary environment at my previous school, when spankings were given here the atmosphere was almost jocular. Each of the form master's slippers or plimsolls, of course, had names, for my first time, I received a Archie. When your behaviour was felt to have crossed a certain threshold, you were called out from your seat, told to bend over, received your wax and returned to your seat. The spanking stung and brought tears to your eyes, but it was generally only around three strokes and was quite bearable. Then the lesson continued. One of the few occasions when I recall the master actually sounding angry was when one boy was heard in conversation with a boy from another class in the corridor, and they used naughty words. The resultant whacking seemed more severe than most. Girls never got their bottoms smacked, at least not in school. Maybe they were simply better behaved than the boys, but more likely it might have been against the local regulations. After we finally moved house, I spent just over a year at another state primary school. However, here there was little evidence of CP going on. I certainly witnessed none, though I did hear of a boy being slippered in another class for the back chat. Finally, I attended an old-fashioned boys' public school. CP was certainly used, but slipperings and canings in the senior school were rare enough to become hot news topics around the school very quickly. In the junior school, some housemasters were much more likely to slipper boys than others. This generally happened in private, although I recall a couple of instances when a master administered a severe whacking in the class, or just outside the door, reducing the victim to a sorry, weeping state. In the senior school, being caught smoking was generally an automatic caning, although some housemasters never seemed to cane their charges, preferring to issue lines or detentions. I must have mixed with a bad crowd, as several of my own friends were caned by their housemaster, or the headmaster, either for smoking or general misbehaviour. 
In my house, in the 1970s, smacking was a pretty common occurrence. My mother stayed at home to raise her two sons and she never hesitated to reinforce the rules with a good smack as and when necessary. I wouldn't say her methods were terribly extreme but she definitely made her point very, very clear. The smacking was always administered in private in the offender's bedroom, and it was almost always over her knee. No exceptions were made. As I got older she had stopped using her hand and started using a wooden spoon to make herself understood. I would almost always be sent to my room to wait for my punishment, which was undoubtedly the worst part. Then my mother would come in holding that spoon, which had a long, thin handle and a small round head just bigger than a silver dollar. Once I was over her knee, she applied that spoon vigorously to my rear, alternating from one cheek to the next very rapidly. The punishment itself was equivalent to lightning striking. I was never able to count the strokes but I don't think she ever stopped until every square inch of my behind was covered. On one particular day, however, which was probably in about 1979 or thereabouts, she decided that whatever I had done warranted my first taste of the belt. It would be the only time I ever received a spanking with the belt but I much preferred it to her wooden spoon. The reason for my preference was that she didn't appear to know how to wield it very effectively. I was told to go to my room, as usual, but this time she followed me in and told me that I was going to get a receiver dose of the belt. This horrified me and I was speechless. She then proceeded to take out the little white belt that I might wear with Sunday clothes and told me that because it was my first time, I would only receive two strokes. I was too stunned to say anything. I was ordered to bend over my bed. I did as I was told, and when I bent over, at the time shaking with fear. I can never remember another time when I have felt so completely at someone else's mercy. My mother didn't fold the belt over, however. She seemed to think that if she stood back far enough she could whip me with its entire length. The only problem appeared to be that her aim wasn't very good, and so she had to deliver each stroke very slowly in order to hit the target. Consequently, it didn't hurt at all and I wasn't complaining. After two very ineffective strokes, she simply put the belt away and left. I'm not sure but I suspect that she was somewhat embarrassed by her lack of skill, I didn't bother to offer a critique. All I know is, the next time I was due for a spanking, she went right back to her trusty wooden spoon. I was in my formative years, my family started attending a semi-fundamentalist Protestant church. I guess my mother was maybe feeling overwhelmed or something, because she was somehow convinced by this church that she needed to start spanking her offspring and taking the old saying literally, decided she needed a rod. For this purpose, she drafted a wooden kitchen spoon. When she made this particular announcement, I was a bit skeptical of the whole proposition. I remember that while talking to a relative on the phone, I said something along the lines of, well, Mom's using the spoon to discipline us all now to which she replied that I was included in the new regime. Well, it was inevitable, I suppose, that she'd eventually find cause to spank me and that's where this story picks up steam. The church had this little fenced in area for youngsters to play in before and after services and one Sunday I was watching my brother while my mom took my sisters to the car. The plan was that she would bring the car around for us once she got the babies into their car seats so that my brother wouldn't go nuts while she seated them. This wasn't a bad plan but my little brother didn't react well. He wasn't very happy that mom had gone and was getting upset. So I pointed across the street to her on the parking lot to calm him down. Well, this didn't work at all, and he went nuts, started screaming and crying. When mom got back, she asked why he was freaking out. Two girls who had been in the little fence with us told mom that I had shown him that she was leaving, omitting the fact that my brother was already freaked out when I pointed her out. Mom got mad about this. She got us into the car and told me that I was going to get the spoon when we got home. I don't remember if I tried to explain what had happened and she didn't listen, 
or if I just got indignant and figured I'd take it and to hell with her, but the sentence was final. I think this might have had at least something to do with my comments earlier on the phone as if she wanted to establish authority or something. But the spanking was going to be when we got home, which was at least a half hour's drive away. And we were also going to go to lunch with another family from the church. So I would have a long time to anticipate my impending fate. As we approached the restaurant, I asked that we please not discuss the spanking with the other family, and mom agreed. Some relief. But when we arrived, the other family wasn't there anyway. So mom put it to me whether I would rather we go on into the restaurant and eat ourselves, or just go straight home and get my spanking over with. I chose the latter, and we went on home. When we got home, she fed us and then took the wooden spoon from a drawer in the kitchen and took me to the bathroom. She sat on a bathroom chair, put me over her knee, and began to spank me with the spoon. When the spanking was finished I retreated to my bedroom following the spanking, to mull the whole thing over.